We are the Architects Climate Action Network. We are a volunteer organization that come together around three main aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. We have nine thematic groups and the Climate Emergency Conservation Area Toolkit that we'll hear about tonight was born out of the existing buildings group. You're all very welcome to join any of our thematic groups and you'll see the QR code on the screen now that will take you to the various groups WhatsApp joining links. Um, so yes, we have much to get through. So I'm going to very briefly introduce our first speaker and just a, a quick overview of the uh, schedule for the evening. Um, we, as you see, have got plenty of people here to share their knowledge, um, but we're gonna start with uh, Chris Proctor. So Chris is director of Proctor Real Architects in Islington in London. And there is so much I could say about Chris, um, but he's incredibly passionate about all things sustainability from teaching to designing and campaigning. And he has been active in ACAN since the very beginning. He is lead author of the Climate Emergency Conservation Area Toolkit. So without any further ado, we're gonna hand over to Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, right, okay, so this is the cover page and this is where you can download it. I'm sure some of you have. I just wanna say that it has been updated and been up in the process of updating this last week. So the current and final version is the 4th of December, you can see here. And that that is the current version. So if you have downloaded an earlier one from a week ago, you can go back and download the current one. It's updated in quite a few different ways. We're on 27 years now of COPs. So climate change has been a long time thinking about developing and it's time to action rather than keep thinking about things. So in light of that, um, I've been looking at a um, particular area of housing, which is a difficult area in, in, the, in the context of, of conservation and listed buildings. The aim of this toolkit is to provide a worked example to update conservation area guidance that allows a complete or more complete retrofit and this is looking at the work that Letty did last year, 2021, launched the, the Climate Emergency Retrofit Guide. And, and Letty estimated that 20%, well, 20% of our UK total carbon emissions come from home, homes. Letty has estimated a quarter of those is in heritage or architectural constrained homes. So if we look at 20% of total UK carbon emissions, 5% of total carbon emissions are from heritage or architecturally constrained homes. So that's still a sizable piece of the UK carbon emission budget every year, 5% from heritage and architectural constrained homes. So it's not something we can't ignore. We have to work on all, on all four fronts. If we look at climate declarations around the country, most councils have declared 338 uh, out of the 409 district authorities have declared a climate emergency of some type, not always the same date, but they have declared. In London, we have 27 of the 32 councils have declared on or before 2030. So quite a tight deadline that the bulk of councils have declared. We have to look at this figure, it's eight years away. Most of London has declared for eight years away, kind of frightening, the timetable. If we look at conservation in particular, well, I had said before that 5% of our, <clears throat> of our carbon emissions come from conservation and heritage buildings and architectural buildings outside conservation. But if we look at conservation areas <clears throat> themselves, in some areas, L Greater London is 17% within conservation area by land area. And more than 10% of London more than 10% of all English conservation areas are in London. If we look in central London authorities, Westminster has 78% land area covered in conservation. Kensington and Chelsea is 73%. And Islington, where this study uh, took place, is 50%. Uh, even the city of Bath is only 52%. So London councils have high percentages of of conservation areas. So that means that London councils have to work more to get a net zero, how to get a net zero when you have all of this conservation within your boundaries. The toolkit 
was decided d- divine, divided into four steps. First is designation, second is appraisal, third is element analysis, and the fourth is an action plan. The designation is a review of the current conservation area that exists. The appraisal is, is looking at whether conservation areas have had building appraisals. And these building appraisals are ranked of buildings from negative, neutral, positive, or listed. And this is from UK planning policy guidance and historic England recommended building audits. And this sets out an appraisal system within a conservation area that gives us some tools to work with from from negative to positive listed categories. The third element is, is, the third step is an element analysis and is looking at parts of buildings. Some councils have already done this, but this is quite useful in, in looking at retrofit. If you want to retrofit certain aspects, element anal- appraisals can be very helpful. The last one is the, this, the action plan. So I'll get into all of these. If we look at designation, this is the area study, an Islington Conservation Area, CA 13 Cross Street. And it is a very small conservation area. So it was quite easy to study 173 buildings, but it is also an old one. It is 52 years old. It was only, it was born three years after the act that set up conservation areas in 1967. So it is, it has been around a long time. It is a very um, interesting conservation area. You'll see uh, as I follow forward. Um, The last boundary change was 30 years ago. And the last set of guidance documents for this conservation area was 20 years ago. So this conservation area just has a basic mapping designation and five pages of guidance. It doesn't have any appraisal. So it's quite quite good to study. Um, and there are issues with the boundary. There are issues that you may look at if you're uh, looking at the designation. The, the boundary moves in and out. In some cases, I don't understand why, because there are buildings within uh, these little pieces that probably should be part of the um, area, but that's not of the main topic tonight. The the next stage, step two, is a building audit appraisal. Now, many conservation areas have this, which is the designation of negative, neutral, positive listed. This area did not have. So we did this ourselves. We went through and audited all the buildings. You can see the red in the mapping are the negative buildings. The blue are the listed terraces. These are primarily six listed Georgian terraces. So this gives a scope, a a granular assessment of what's in in this area. But what's surprising is that 22% of the buildings have some degree of harm, that they are not a positive contributors to this conservation area. They're negative or maybe they have some harm in, in in their scope. But the other interesting thing is that this area has 60 shops, and of these 60 shops, 62% of the shops present some harm. There are only 11 unharmed exemplary shops um, in this conservation area. So this data gives us something to work with. Um, This is an appraisal management mapping for Westminster. London Borough of Westminster did this in 2008. So it's it's now 14 years ago, a small conservation area. And you can see the, the red, orange are negative buildings. The blue, pale blue are the listed buildings. The orange are neutral. So the negative and neutral buildings are, are greater scope to do more retrofit or change. Whereas the listed buildings you would, you would leave as they are. There's, there's an analysis here we can look at. Um, And the the definitions on the right from Kensington and Chelsea, building audit classes uh, give a very good description of what the categories mean, the listed buildings, the positive buildings, the neutral buildings, and the negative. I'll just read the negative. Negative buildings are those that are clearly harmful to the character of the area. Their removal and redevelopment would be welcome subject to the highest quality design. Now, in the past, negative buildings were often targeted for demolition. Now, in a more um, enlightened view with embodied carbon, we think that negative buildings can be completely refurbished and refurbished 
you know, to a, to a high level where they will contribute again to the conservation area rather than demolish them. Neutral buildings um, may blend into the townscape by virtue of their form, scale, and materials, but due to their level of design quality, fail to make a positive contribution. So neutral buildings don't quite come up to a positive level in terms of details. They may fit the size and the scale of the neighborhood, but um, the detailing leaves something to be sure. Um, so they may also be suitable candidates for more extensive retrofit. So some conservation areas have, have a lot of these types of buildings. Conservation is not just listed in positive buildings. Conservation areas are, are, are quite diverse. The third step is this element in the audit. And I, I took this for several categories, uh, elements of building, roof extensions, projecting features, renewables, windows, walls, and shop fronts. These were customized for the Cross Street 13 conservation area. Every conservation area will be different and these may change. Some conservation areas won't have shop fronts. So you wouldn't really look at this category, but many of these are similar. You'll have to add and change them. This is an element appraisal. So this is not new. It hasn't been reinvented. There are two here. The one on the right is London Borough of Westminster roof extension element audit. And this again was 14 years ago, 2008. Uh, so this we looked at before, but in this case, the buildings <clears throat> that are red are out of scale and, 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 and designed up to the height, full heights, whereas um, the, the green are listed buildings and the purple are ones where they've designated there could be roof extensions. So they've done a fine grain analysis where you could do some work and some change to these buildings according to how they present a um, positive contribution to the conservation area. So this fine grain analysis has started already. This is another one on the left, Red Car in Cleveland, which did a window type element audit. So we have two types of windows, casement typology and a sliding sash typology. So again, it's a detail level. It's not a building level. It's a detail level of an element. And these have been happening. If we look into this more carefully from the, the case of this audit, look at roof extensions. Taking the Cross Street conservation area in particular, as the example that was studied in this in this report, we we looked at um, the blue, the dark blue are the original traditional roofs. So many of these are the listed buildings, but the red are possible new roofs that could be rebuilt. Either roofs have been destroyed, or the buildings are very low and they they could be built up to fit the the streetscape. Um, so all in all, 50% of the buildings are traditional with uh, extent original roofs and 50% have been changed or are suitable for change. The green uh, indicate roof terraces. So these green roofs are flat roofs where people have put terraces, which is quite interesting because people want greenery in a congested urban environment that's been happening. The yellow are roofs that have been extended already from existing buildings. So we've got some analysis here. Looking at the roof types, this was a very interesting conservation area because there were 14 types found. On the left, we have the traditional roofs, M roof. We have the London, the London inverted pitch roof here in the middle um, and some other types of inverted roofs. Whereas on the right, we have modern roofs, flat roofs or roofs that have been um, rebuilt on top of traditional buildings or roof terraces um, and, and changed roofs. So this is where we get the 50% change versus the traditional roof. If we look at um, the guidance that exists in Islington and, and other councils, we have often have supplementary planning documents where you have a very vague diagram of, of a roof extension. This is an allowable roof extension in, in the Urban Design Guide S. PD, which, which allows you a modern block on top of the roof as long as it's set back and not visible. The problem is that these guides are very vague and there are problems with cold bridging, problems with overheating. 
with these glass boxes, they have no shading. What we need are more detailed ST SPDs with higher levels of insulation, uh, breathe soleil to prevent overheating, um, and also a connection of how we insulate the roof and tie it in without cold bridge to perhaps future internal insulation on the front facade on the right, or external insulation on the rear facade, how these sort of tie together so we don't get uh, problematic cold bridges where you could get moisture problems. This is another one with a, a with a, a taller, more traditional roof. Again, Urban Design Guide Islington, um, which advocates um, this type of roof. Again, they're very small, not much insulation, um, problems with cold bridge connections. We need to have a more detailed diagram showing how we insulate um, and how we can wrap the building where you have a front facade preserved, internal insulation, and perhaps at the back at the rear, you extend insulation down the back of the building. This will prevent cold bridge and moisture um, through the building. Of course, there's a lot of technology and techniques to do these so that you have moisture wicking through uh, ins insulation that's open, moisture open, but I'm not gonna get into that. And I'll go through a couple quick other examples, windows. Um, windows in this conservation area of 173 buildings, um, it was found that there were very few original buildings, even uh, original windows, even on the Georgian terraces. Most of the six over six window sash had been replaced. Um, and it was from counting an audit of every building type, it was found that perhaps 75% of the windows could be upgraded to double glazed windows. These are the four window types in this neighborhood. We have a classical sash, six over six, that would be a Georgian or early Victorian um, re or Regency. We have a distinctive sash, which would be a little bit on from that with slightly different mullion spacing and perhaps introduction of horns. Georgian windows generally did not have horns. Horns were a later introduction in Victorian times. So we can tell the window history by the presence of the horn at the bottom of the top sash you can see here. We have a functional sash, which was often one over one or two over two panes, much bigger sheets of glass um, in, in a Victorian type window. And we have modern casements. Often these were metal criddle windows in social housing or in modern windows. These are the four main types in this neighborhood. Um, we can see here that a Georgian terrace, a listed terrace, has had windows replaced really clearly here. You can see one over one, a Victorian later window replacing what would have been six over six on the left here. Now, there is discussion of this from historic England saying that if you if you if these windows are unlikely to contribute to the significance of these buildings and we might think that we should replace them with new windows of a sympathetic historic pattern i.e six over six but also with double glazing and this could provide an opportunity to enhance the significance of this terrace by reinstating a sympathetic window type, but at also at the same time, we can do something for retrofit and climate emergency by putting a better insulated window in at the same time. Chris, um, I, it yeah. pains me to interrupt One, you, yeah. but we have a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So so you can see on this uh, view, these, these obviously changed windows. You can see more here, more bad examples. The, the one on the bottom right is an in a listed building, this sash. So these types of windows, are, you can say, can could be changed quite easily. Um, they're not original. Um, and then if we look at the types of windows, um, if we say that uh, the what, number one is a single glare of glass, if you put in a, a slim profile double glaze unit, it's 2.3 times better than single glazing. Now, secondary internal windows are uh, about two times better. So an insulated um, sash can be 2.3, um, a slim cavity could be 2.5, a vacuum insulated glass could be four times. So these on the left are Georgian sash with small mullions, on the right, a Victorian, where you can get even much higher, up to 6.25 times better than single glazing. Um, this is all in the guide. 
I'm basically just recovering. The last, the last thing quickly is into external wall insulation. It was found that 44% of the wall surfaces of this area could be externally wall insulated without harming heritage and not touching listed buildings. So what is the action plan step four? It's we're looking at local development orders um, and listed local listed building consent orders, which will be talked about later. And also um, uh, developing better SPD guidance and also perhaps over time as one can uh, upgrade the conservation area appraisals themselves. So the local development orders um, came about in 2004. I think that Chris Joffe will be talking about that further. The local listed building consent orders um, came about from an, an act in 2013. And Sarah Buckingham, who was responsible for this guide, is talking to us later about what Kensington Chelsea has done. These, these are quite efficient tools to, to make change. The last thing I'll mention, and then I'll wrap up, is that um, Islington and many councils have supplementary planning documents. And here, Islington has environmental design planning guidance and a supplementary planning document for urban design guide. These were written in 2012 and 17. They're due for updates. Islington has, has told us that they're going to update. Um, the ones in Camden on the right were written just two years ago, and they're very good, but in two years, things have changed. And, and there are some things that are still not accounted for now. Um, you could say extension form, factors are not considered, roof designs may be out of date because they show coal bridges. External wall insulation is not detailed and shown very well in this guide for home improvements. Window, window de detail designs have very little details and they don't really address overheating um, with windows at high level roof areas. So there are sort of fine points of retrofit design that in the last two years haven't been addressed in this otherwise quite a good guide from Camden. Um, and so the, these are documents um, that can be shared council to council and hopefully there'll be more sharing of these kinds of documents. Um, I think that's, that's me. Thank you, Chris. I mean, I think we can sense that there's probably a huge amount more knowledge in your mind and particularly with all the work that you've put into this and it's a terribly difficult thing to try and condense into 15 maybe 20 minutes um yes, so thank I'm you very much to show a brief view look go and reese and look up the guide itself everything absolutely else the i've shared that in the chat so people can have a little look um so well done um chris for that and i'm sure that there, i've already seen plenty of questions coming into the chat box so if you have questions uh continue to add them in there um next we will have uh, Councillor Caroline Russell from uh, Islington Local Authority. Um, Caroline is also leader of the Green Party in the London Assembly and covers economy, environment and transport. Now, Caroline, we're just going to get to look at your beautiful face and not going to do any slides. So um, whenever you're ready to unmute, you can just um, take, the, take the mic. Yes, I certainly will. So good evening, everyone. And oh my goodness, this is so inspiring, Chris, seeing the work that you've done because all that campaigning to get climate emergencies declared um, and then seeing some of the actual work that is do, you know, is actually helping councils to think about what they have to change in order to meet their net zero commitments. It's just really, really inspiring. So thank you. Um, so I'm Caroline Russell. I have been a councillor here in Islington for eight and a half years. Um, I was on my own for eight years with 47 Labour councillors. And um, I now have three colleagues, which is fantastic. And I'm also on the London Assembly, where, in fact, I now concentrate on health and policing, um, although I'm still very interested in transport and environment and economy. Um, and so as an Assembly member, my job is to check on the Mayor of London and check he's doing a good job. Um, as a councillor, my job is to represent people in Islington, and sometimes I get people coming to me from all over the borough, kind of with a sort of conservation glitch where they've um, not been able to get to do the, the upgrade they want to do for their windows or whatever, and I've ended up 
helping them navigate their way through the planning system. Um, but I also have a lot of residents who live in social rent homes. And I just want to touch on something that Chris raised, um, which is the importance of thinking about thermal bridges when um, doing retrofit work. Because what I'm seeing and picking up in the social rented sector is huge amounts of mould and condensation, which is forming at the point where the external balcony meets the internal wall. And then you've got an upstairs flat and a downstairs flat, and they get the mould and condensation forming um, at those points where the balcony is meeting their, their walls. And the lack of knowledge in repair departments about active ventilation, about ways to actually deal with this um, is really worrying. And I think there is a whole piece of work around retrofit um, and, and skilling people up to understand how to make these homes fit to live in. And that, you know, the, we have problems with thermal bridges, you know, Chris has explained in, in street properties as well. Um, but that just feels like a piece of, um, of, of knowledge that really needs to be expanded so that people understand not to blame the residents for literally just living in their home and breathing um, and you know washing their clothes or cooking some food and creating a bit of steam. Um, you know we we really do have a big big piece of work to do to, to reduce the, the blight of mould and condensation. Um, but uh, the, so one of the things that this, you know, these heartbreaking stories that people were showing me, you know, cot bedding covered in moulds, they were showing me whole walls behind a, a wardrobe covered in mould. So I did a, a, a report um, on the London Assembly as chair of the Environment Committee called Keeping Out the Chill, which was published in um, uh, 2019, I'm pretty sure. And, um, and we looked at a project in Thamesmead where there had been some really clever, very affordable retrofit done to turn build it, concrete buildings that um, I could just imagine from my knowledge of buildings in Islington would have been very mouldy and full of condensation, um, particularly when those homes were overcrowded. And with an active ventilation retrofit, they had actually made those homes into really decent places to live and very affordably per flat. It was three or 4,000 pounds per flat. Um, but I'm going to move on from that and um, report back from the council because I knew I was coming tonight and I checked in with Rowena Champion, who is executive member for um, uh, environment and transport and with the um, uh, head of the whole planning team at the council. And first of all, Councillor Champion sends apologies. She is at a planning meeting tonight that relates to a building in her ward. She has to be there. That also means that the senior planning officers are also at the planning meeting tonight, so they're not able to be here. And uh, Karen Sullivan, um, who's kind of head of the department, um, uh, the director level person is on leave. So they all send masses of po massive apologies. And Karen in particular said she was really disappointed not to be able to join you here tonight. Now, um, the I think the thing that is really clever that you've done with this report is you have massively raised the, um, raised the game and you've shown what can be done in one conservation area. Now, obviously you've done masses of detailed work and Islington has tons and tons and tons of buildings that are not in the one conservation area that you've addressed with this report. Um, and I think they're very clear that they're not gonna be able to replicate the, that level of detailed um, work across Islington because they want to get on and give people across Islington good advice to enable them to retrofit their homes uh, more quickly than it would than if they kind of worked at the same level of detail that you've worked. But they really welcome all your comments on the SPD and they say that they very much align with the thinking amongst the council officers, although um, with the caveat about the kind of level of detailed work that you've managed to do on this particular project. Um, 
but what they are doing is making sure that the planning policies on conservation and net zero kind of come together and align properly. Um, and they're preparing a simple guide to the council's planning policies. They've got their 15 minute duty planner appointments, but they're actually gonna go beyond that. And they're seeking some carbon offset funding to be able to employ a development management officer who will be able to give people pre-application advice, um, both for residents and for small businesses. So they're trying to expand their capacity to give people advice about retrofit. Um, if any um, case officer recommends refusing permission for doing something that relates to retrofit, that is gonna to have to be referred up to Karen Sullivan. So it goes right up to the top of the planning team um, uh, for, for review. They're also gonna be investigating examples where people think that the conservation policies are acting as a barrier to retrofit, but they say they can't deal with anecdotes. They want to have actual residents, actual house numbers, actual street addresses, if they're going to do that kind of analysis and, 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 and have a look at the situation. They've appointed someone to work on the net zero carbon SPD, and they've got underway with the work. And it's going to be based on sound technical evidence, um, including evidence on retrofitting measures for historic uh, buildings and conservation buildings. And they're gonna take a whole life costing approach to that. They've also got a specialist conservation officer post working alongside the SPD officer. And um, they're going to also be looking at other planning policies and guidance to make sure that they're consistent with the SPD. So this includes the Islington Urban Design Guide, the conservation area appraisals, the conservation area management plans, and Article, Article 4 directions. And they're also going to be trying to follow best practice with their design codes. So what it, you know, to me as an outsider, not having been involved in this, I think it looks like you have had a huge amount of influence here and you've actually got the planning department really thinking about what it meant when in summer of 2019 Islington Council declared a climate emergency. You know, they're really thinking about what that means from a planning perspective. So uh, my advice is, you know, wow, amazing campaigning, really, really important piece of work. And um, uh, the, the, the important thing that, uh, that you can do is keep that dialogue going, keep coming up with the good examples of people who, you know, retrofit homes and, and kind of, you know, finding ways, for helping them to find solutions is really, really helpful. And I think, you know, just by the way you've done this massive piece of work in this one cross street conservation area, you've actually shown the way and, you know, got the council to start taking some action. And my job is to scrutinise and check that they keep up to speed with what they're doing. And it will be a pleasure to keep working with you, Chris, and everyone else um, to make sure you know that uh, that I'm well enough informed to be able to hold the council to account on that. So that's me. That's ten minutes and eight seconds. Yeah, but you know I had you as nine minutes and fifty four seconds, so you're a winner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I set the timer going before I unmuted. <laughs> Thank you very much, Caroline, for the perspective from um, Islington side. It's really um, enriching the, the context for this. Um, and I'm sure I've seen again lots of questions coming through for you. So hopefully we'll get to those. Um, we now have Will South. Um, Will is an engineer and director at Etude. Um, Will focuses on low energy building design and sustainability and construction, uh, with particular focus on heat transfer, construction quality, building physics, and building fabric engineering or so your LinkedIn profile said. <laughs> I just know Will as being like all around brilliant, involved in all sorts of advice and Letty and other things. Um, but you're also a pacifier, certifier and designer and London group lead for the Association of Environment Conscious Building. Um, but over to you, Will. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, share my screen. Uh, I can't claim I'm going to do such a great job of timekeeping but I'll do my best maybe I'll come in under time um so building on the um 
uh, the great work that Chris has done. Chris has really gone into some fantastic detail and and just really showed like the power of you know, a few people looking into this in a lot of depth um, and how much that can sort of release other people to do some great work. And I just wanted to highlight some other things that are happening in the industry um, and sort of encourage people, you know, you all in whatever part of it you, you occupy um, to get involved and, and, and be part of this. Um, so that's the idea. Um, uh, so I think it's a really exciting times for retrofit. There's undeniably an incredibly steep hill to climb. It's one of the biggest nuts to crack um, in the UK. Uh, how, however, um, there's some positive signs. And I think this sort of kit and the fact that we've got the council practitioners talking to one another and talking the same language is really great. Um, good retrofit at scale is happening. Example shown certainly at scale. Time will tell whether it's good or not. Um, however, what we're seeing um, from, a, from an engineering and a technical background is that often there's some really good things happening and then also some really missed opportunities. And I think these missed opportunities and, and not quite getting to where the projects could get put the pressure more so on, on projects where it's conservation, heritage, maybe just attachment of people for, for certain buildings. So I think one of the key themes with conservation areas, but actually all existing buildings, is to find the opportunities and just to go for the opportunities. And then we can sort of relieve some of the, um, the pressure elsewhere where and when I'm saying that I'm not meaning individual buildings I'm meaning on an individual building doing some of the work Chris has done and really challenging yourself to push the areas that can be pushed to allow us to, to sort of preserve the areas where we're really really concerned um, so that's an important point point. Um, when we get to sort of funding and work that's actually happening in practice I think we're seeing a lot of it is is quite fragmented so we're still seeing a lot of element by element retrofit piecemeal and not whole house retrofit the planned execution that we perhaps hope um, as practitioners um, and then when we get to site you know the workforce and the people both in design and also construction and those two have to work really well together um, there's still problems there probably will be problems um, in construction for a while to come but we've got to try and address those get the feedback loops try and improve things um, so all those things still happen. Um, however, there's big effort from industry, and I use industry in its broadest sense, right from building owners, homeowners, through to sort of the more commercial side and property and real estate management. And that's great, and I feel that it's sort of coming together. So I just wanted to show you two examples of that. Um, the, the Letty Climate Emergency Retrofit Guide and some work for the London Council's Retrofit London Housing Action Plan, which are both public documents that you can point to and hopefully support and will help you convince people to do some of the work that, like Chris has done. Um, so the Climate Emergency Retrofit Guide um, gives a lot of context behind some of the need for retrofit. So if you're looking to action some of the work in Chris's document, but you're struggling to convince people, there's a lot of resources in here about why it's needed, why it applies to the sort of building you're talking about. Um, it also sets out what good looks like. So we've helped Chris through this, the creation of this guide to make sure that the sorts of proposals he's he's putting forward for planning guidance match what would be needed at scale across the UK to meet our climate objectives. And that's really important. Those things are tied together and we sort of have a very clear idea of what good looks like. Um, there's also a part where it identifies opportunities or natural opportunities where things in building maintenance come up and we should be improving the energy efficiency of the buildings at the same time, which would have huge cost effectiveness um, and, and, and help ease the pain of doing some of this um good so there's some of the sort of good outcomes the graphics that you can use freely to express to, to other stakeholders why this is needed and and sort of the breadth of covered you know it was covered a bit just just then by a colleague that retrofit is so much more about than about energy and carbon it has impact on people's lives and how they live day to day in their homes or workplaces and that should be um should, the, the opportunity there should be maximized um, it has infrastructure impact. It means we need less power stations. It means we need less road digging up, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really sort of knock on, knock on, knock on. Um, the retrofit guide looked at housing stock as a whole and 
Um, and that's interesting because I think that, you know, no two homes are the same, no two buildings are the same. And we can appreciate that there already is a distribution of, of performance. And what we'd like to do is narrow the distribution and shift it down. It does. It's not saying that all buildings need to be to a certain energy standard. Um, there will be that natural variation and that's OK. We just need to make sure that we're where the opportunities do exist, you know, summer towards the middle of that uh, and, and lower end of that uh, normal distribution so we're moving from the blue area which is the existing bit housing stock i think the light color there is flats and the uh this sort of off blue color here is semi-detached homes i mean you need to shift all that to the left um and reduce you know the majority of energy consumption in homes um chris gave some summary of num high level numbers um and around 25 percent of buildings have heritage constraints i think particularly from a london point of view people have an impression that lots of homes are terrace houses actually the biggest single house type is 1950s semis most homes are actually post 1950s so you know there's a different type of housing stock that we we've, there's a big opportunity on lots of those are still in conservation areas um good um i touched on the importance of a whole plan for the building a whole house plan or a whole building plan in some respect this is covered by past 2038 past 2035 um and it's important that this isn't you don't have to do it all at once i think is the idea it, it needs to be an end goal and um, whatever you're doing whatever the first phase is needs to set you on the road towards that goal and what's important is we don't accidentally take these wrong turns and end up locking in poorer performance um, and by having this end goal, knowing how that fits in with the whole picture and looking at some of the work that's in the conservation toolkit on how to do this, um, you'll, um, you know, it will enable getting to that phase four within a reasonable time. Um, Annex C of the uh, this guide is in some way the kindling beneath the conservation toolkit, which Chris did. These are some very early ideas on just, you know, a, a rough in, insulation strategy in certain streets. And, and that's really been then brought forward into a fantastic piece of work and, and very detailed piece of work looking at an example conservation area. Um, second one just to look at. Um, this was some work we've done for London councils for local authorities, including Islington, um, and it's around accelerating retrofit within Greater London. So this is a sort of call for any other people looking to do some work in a key friction point for retrofit and some enabling work. There's some ideas in here which councils, professionals can uh, work on to enable retrofit at scale. Um, there's 19 recommendation actions. Number nine, enable planning to facilitate low carbon retrofit, including in conservation areas, is essentially exactly what the ACAN document does, which is fantastic. Um, and it's really you know, it's superb to see that. So um, can't say it was our idea, but it was lovely to, that, that those sorts of all these pieces from industry and, and, um, and voluntarily are tying together and sort of moving us forward in a very positive way. Um, so just in summary, um, you know, the conservation areas, they do matter, as Chris said, we will have to improve the energy efficiency of those homes, but we can do it sensitively, we can work together to do a really good job, um, and we can have a very positive impact on, on how those properties feel as well as how they look. So thank you, Laura. You did come in under time. <laughs> The gold star for you. <laughs> um, that's brilliant, Will. And they are incredible documents, both of them. I have two very well thumbed copies on my desk, which I refer to all the time. Can't recommend them enough. Um, we are now going to hear from Chris Joffe. Um, Chris is a consultant uh, to Arab and chair of the Independent Welsh Government Advisory Group. Um, on the decarbonisation of existing housing. Um, Chris was Arab's global buildings retrofit leader and led the team that produced the 2016 report towards the delivery of a national uh, residential energy efficient, efficiency programme. Um, so now I'm going to share Chris's slides. And so you'll have to bear with me um, for one moment while I share my screen. So, so Chris, over to you and you can just tell me when you'd like me to move to the next slide. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, we know that in England alone, there are over 10,000 conservation areas and areas of particular national and local significance. There are many more if we include the devolved administrations. Uh, Chris Proctor and Will South have already told us of the 20, 2021 Letty Climate Emergency Retrofit Guides estimate that heritage or architectural constraints involve a quarter of all UK homes. That's more than 7 million homes. Chris also reminded us that the energy we use in our homes is responsible for about 20% of all UK greenhouse gas emissions. That means there needs to be a deep retrofit of virtually all UK housing, including that within conservation areas, if we are to have any chance of achieving net zero. A major challenge of residential decarbonisation is to accelerate the delivery of appropriate measures in the right places, and we know that the planning system can delay progress or it can accelerate it. The UK housing stock is regionally diverse, so what we can do that will change the appearance of our homes must be determined locally. And in this brief presentation, I'll outline some thoughts about how the planning system can help to do this in a way that accelerates decarbonisation. Only one of these images is from a conservation area, but each shows distinctive local architecture. We need, excuse me, we need an approach that works not only for buildings in conservation areas, but also for buildings in areas of distinctive local character. I would like to see local planners, architects, conservation experts and engineers collaborate to deliver, develop design ideas for visually acceptable changes to the appearance of those buildings, changes that are sensitive to local character and history. Possibly there would be local voting to decide which ideas are preferred. Once those have been decided, standard construction details that work well on local architects, archetypes should be developed and tested. Local authorities would then publish local development orders that clearly define what is visually and technically acceptable in their jurisdictions. This approach would not, must not remove the need for every home to be properly understood and assessed and the right measures chosen and then installed to set the home on its journey to net zero. We can't have inappropriate materials or detailing that results in poor performance or causes harm to the building fabric or to the health of the occupants. Under the approach I am proposing, when homeowners in locations affected by a local development order decide to decarbonize their homes, their retrofit designers can, when appropriate, adopt one of the published appearances and work can proceed without having to seek permission. Retrofit designers can still develop designs whose appearance does not conform to the published models and seek planning permission, but homeowners would then run the risk of delay and possible refusal. Consider, for example, a street of private rented student accommodation in Cardiff's Cathedral Road conservation area. To improve the energy efficiency of the properties, as required by the next iteration of the Mies regulations, it may well be appropriate to install external wall insulation and to replace doors and windows. To require every landlord in the street to seek planning permission is unworkable, not only from the perspective of the landlords who have only two months each year to carry out work on their properties, but also from the perspective of the planners who do not have the resources to deal with ever increasing numbers of requests. Of course, all this will require new public money. My guess is that the work I'm suggesting might cost on average two to three million pounds per local authority, and there are about 400 local authorities in the UK. So that adds up to a billion pounds, which spread over, say, five years would average a cost to central government of 200 million pounds per year. That's a trivial sum compared with what the UK government spends in a typical year. I'm aware of several precedents for this approach. The first comes from Wales and demonstrates how change can be done sensitively. In 2012, the Royal Society of Architects in Wales, Welsh Government, CADU, and two social landlords launched the Redesigning the Terrace design competition, which sought to encourage low energy demand designs that would show how existing unused or derelict housing plots could be brought back into beneficial use in a way that is sensitive to the local character and history, either through comprehensive refurbishment or by careful insertion of new construction. It attracted many entries and Hatcher Pritchard architects were the winners. My second precedent comes from Leeds, in 2007, Leeds City Council commissioned comprehensive research into the back-to-back -back housing in the city to identify the various constraints of the house type and to develop a strategy to tackle these issues. The research undertaken found that while back-to-backs in their current form and condition were unsustainable, 
with targeted intervention and investment, including relatively modest public funding, they could become attractive starter homes for households on below average incomes, once again forming a key part of the overall housing provision for Leeds. I've included this work as a precedent because a multi-agency steering group was established to guide the project. The steering group contained local people expert in environmental health, heritage, regeneration and urban sustainability, as well as social and private landlords, architects and pl planners and others. My third precedent comes from Port Sunlight on the Wirral, which has a high proportion of grade two listed properties in private ownership. Analysis of listed building consent applications showed frequent applications for the same three classes of work. Most enforcement issues also covered the same classes of work. So Wirral Council and Port Sunlight Village Trust worked in partnership with financial support from Historic England to develop a local listed building consent order for Port Sunlight to streamline the consent process for residents, to manage change more effectively, and to regain lost heritage features in the village. It covers windows, doors, yard gates, and satellite dishes, and provides detailed construction information. In a very similar move, Red Car and Cleveland Borough Council has published a local development order for the Salt Burn con Conservation Area that covers the installation of replacement windows, doors, and non-traditional roofing materials. In both these locations, the publishing of standard details ensures quality, reduces the burden on the planners, and provides certainty for homeowners. My penultimate precedent comes from Leicestershire, where the North West Leicestershire District Council has prepared this local development order to help facilitate the Colville Frontage Improvement Scheme by streamlining the planning process. The order grants planning permission subject to conditions for the refurbishment or replacement of shop fronts at ground floor level and for the refurbishment, repair or replacement of rainwater goods, brickwork and windows at first floor level and above. Here also, the publishing of standard details ensures quality, reduces the burden on the planners and provides certainty for the homeowners. My last precedent is in Bristol, which has started to address the question of permitted development for external wall insulation. It has done so by identifying three qualifying conditions. The first is flat, rendered front elevations that do not front directly onto a pavement. The second is flat, rendered side elevations that do not front directly onto a pavement. And the third is simple rendered rear elevations that do not face onto a road. Huge numbers of UK homes need fabric improvements to reduce the energy required to keep them warm in the winter. The Bristol approach facilitates this, reduces the burden on the planners and provides certainty for the homeowners. To conclude, this toolkit is important and valuable, not only because current conservation area guidance documents are often either inaccurate or out of date, but also because the toolkit provides clear guidance on how to audit buildings to assess where there are opportunities for climate emergency retrofits that can be applied to both conservation and non-conservation areas. It provides a model for what should be done in every conservation area and area of distinctive local character as a crucial first step towards deciding what is locally acceptable. That's enough from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think my takeaway from yours, oh, also under time, you're all very efficient. Um, I think what you said about reducing the burden on planners, I think that's probably a, a, a key takeaway with all of these um, supporting documents. So really great um, examples that you shared with us. Um, so our final speaker before we get to our Q&A panel um, is Sarah Buckingham. So Sarah is the uh, conservation and design team leader at the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Sarah is also trustee of the London Historic Buildings Trust. Previously, Sarah was a UK planning inspector and head of heritage protection reform at English Heritage. And Sarah, over to you. Okay, great. Well, th thanks to everybody. And there's been some great ideas emerging already. Don't be surprised if you see some of them perhaps emerging in Kensington and Chelsea when we, uh, we look to revamp our conservation area management plans. Um, I could give you some background um, that I think we you probably got the picture by now. Of course, um, Kensington and Chelsea declared a climate emergency uh, and set out its ambitious targets for, for being net zero and carbon neutral. Um, and then putting them into action from that action plan, we have three planning responses, which I, I think are helpful. 
yeah, as, as I was saying, we, of course, as you might have expected, uh, declared a climate emergency in 2019 and set out our targets. Um, in terms of um, planning responses to that, um, we have published a supplementary planning document, which covers all aspects of sustainability, including things like air quality, um, ecology, um, but also a substantial amount of information on retrofitting. And as our new local plan actually goes through now, we're at the Reg 19 stage where we have a, a, a policy explicitly covering re um, retrofitting and stating, you know, that we will take it seriously, um, bearing in mind the, the balance that, that we have to also um, legal duties in respect of conservation areas and listed buildings, but, you know, to, to be more obviously thinking about it and retrofitting and sustainability run through the local plan. Um, the third planning response is, I think, a really practical one, and this is um, creating a local listed building consent order um, for the borough. And what we've decided, um, well, I'll give you a bit of background, sorry about that. Um, as you mentioned, I've worked at Historic England and at the time when these were introduced. Uh, and the point of these orders really is that they're to be, um, well, if, if you were the owner of a listed building, rather than us waiting for you to come forward and ask us if you can do something, is to actually say in advance, you know, to say that actually, yes, you can, to give you that consent in advance. Um, and also to give that consent to more than one building. Um, in fact, in, in our case, it's borough wide uh, and, you know, to set out the details of, of what kind of works can be done. So it's meant to be proactive. It's meant to save people time. And and, and importantly, in, in this case, is to give them certainty that the retrofitting works they're interested in are accepted in principle. You know, there may be some discussion of details and I'll come back to that. But, you know, it, it is, to, you know, it is to set out that clear um, commitment to the principle of it. Um, the works that can be covered in one of these orders are works of any description of alteration. We don't you can't use them for demolition, not surprisingly. And you can apply conditions. So think of them as a super listed building consent. And I think that helps to understand them, I think. I suggested these being very familiar with and to our, our um, planning lead member um, who, well, let's say pounced upon it with a great deal of interest. I think councillors were really keen to find something to, you know, to strike out and do something bold about retrofitting and, and responding to climate change. And I think, as, as has already been mentioned, you know, we have a lot, we have a high coverage of heritage buildings in the borough, uh, a lot of um, listed buildings included. So they were very keen. They sent me what can be described as a punishing timetable for producing it. Um, and we started by looking at um, photovoltaic panels, solar, solar panels on, on buildings and set out, um, created an order to allow people to put those on their on their buildings. I suppose it's just worth sort of saying, if you've looked at the photos, you can see that we have a lot of, it's an urban area. We have lots of tall buildings with lots of concealed roofs with sort of those um, London roofs and other mansards with flat tops. So there's lots and lots, there's acres of places that you can put solar panels on where they, you don't, wouldn't know they were there. Uh, so the order was ambitious, as, a, as I said, it covers the whole borough, um, which means that it, it, it can't be as very specific and we can't provide detailed design as in, in the example we had from, um, was it Port Sunlight? Um, so, but, you know, so it's a different kind of beast from that, but, um, and, but I'll come on to the differences a bit more in a second. Um, it covers all grade two listed buildings uh, and some grade two stars where we decided there wouldn't be any harm from, from including them. Um, if you look at the photos there, the top photo is of the Royal Hospital um, in Chelsea, which some of the, build, the buildings are two star. And you can see them from miles around. You can get 360 degrees views of them across a registered landscape. So we thought exclude those. But then on the, the lower picture, you have a two star terrace, which has got a simple array of London roofs behind a parapet. Um, and they're, they're simply not visible from the public realm. So why wouldn't we include them? Um, yeah, so we don't include churches because we don't grant them um, planning permission. Um, 
Um, I'll come back to that question that appeared in the chat a minute ago. Let me just say that I wasn't in the borough six years ago. Um, so we, yes, we're allowing people solar panels, but also as a result of the public consultation and suggestions from local residents, we're also including solar thermal equipment, which we don't talk about quite so much, and also solar slates, stroke tiles. And we've got, we, you know, those, I think the technology, that's a really good example of how the technology moves on very quickly. And we've seen some really good examples recently, I think maybe 10 years ago or longer when they started coming out, we're going, oh, I'm not sure about that. But now that they look pretty convincing and I think from a distance they blend in very well. Yeah we have applied conditions to this because it is um, a borough wide and you know we can't be uh, we can't focus on every possible permutation. permutation. So what we've, we've done is say um, well, well we've applied some conditions to just to make you know to make sure that they will be sensibly and sensitively um, in, installed. Um, importantly, um, we've mirrored the, the, the conditions in the general permitted development order, which if you're not familiar with it, don't worry, but it, it, what, what the upshot of it this is, if you, uh, if you follow those, you don't need planning permission um, for them either. So we're trying to get rid of the consent permissions, consents um, from the process. Um, we're avoiding putting them on roof slopes facing a highway because that's in the what the GPDO says and that's but that's not to say you might not be able to have um say solar slates or something like that um but we need to go through the consent process so we have a bit more control and you know things like um maintaining them and removing them when they're not needed as we as we know technology will move on maybe the, you know the things the things of the future will be um yeah even better condition six of the order does um allow us to just sign off um, the position, size, fixing, colour, finish, all, all the all the aspects of them that that could make them harmful in, in visually harmful to a listed building. Were you able to see them? Uh, and, and it, you know, there will be some buildings where you can see them. So, you know, so they're not just slapped on the, <laughs> and, you know, possibly a weird colour. Um, you know, that's that's all we want to do. It's a light touch way of of just keeping that last oversight um, to make sure we are preserving our listed buildings but um, in the context of the fact that we accept the principle so we're going to work with people to find a way to make the the appearance acceptable. Um, it also does I mean our, our, our residents are very vigilant so they do want to know what's going on so the fact that a, a conditions application has to be made means that they can just check out what's happening um, and I think that that satisfies their concerns on that front. Um, we are going to work on design guides for residents and I've just put the example there from from the um, I think the CPRE which is great because it, it just shows it's got some wonderful examples in there of how how sensitive you know design for, for, for solar equipment really just makes it blend in um, really well even and, and that church at the bottom of that is, is grade one listed with solar slate on it so that's you know really really positive um yeah just to say that you have to you know, there was a full public consultation as you would expect um, and that's required in the regulations we had very strong local support so you know let's get that out there National heritage organisations less enthusiastic, but on the other hand, not giving us anything substantive to work with. You know, I don't mind if they don't like it, but you know, if it's and you know, if somebody's got improvement, suggested improvements, all the better. But if it's just a general dislike, then there was nothing really to persuade us not to go ahead. Similarly, with Historic England, they had they did have some suggestions which we incorporated into it, but I think you know we weren't going to simply drop it um, because they weren't enthusiastic. Historic owners' bodies were very um, yeah, owners' bodies, you know, people who own listed buildings like um, Historic Houses Association, very enthusiastic. So you know, I think that was our gauging of, of feelings about it. Uh, yes, we are now looking, I know windows is a big issue, we're on, now looking at another order covering window works. Um, we, we, it would allow secondary glazing, subject to conditions about, again, design materials, fixing um, on any window, on any, you know, any in any, I think, grade two building. Um, and then 
we're looking at allowing yeah, allowing replacement with double glazed windows of windows that aren't original to the building. If you do happen to have a surviving original uh, window, it, it's a, it's a, you know a venerable piece of fabric. It is part of the heritage of that building, um, and if they can be repaired, reused, possibly secondary glazed, I think that's an ideal. But I, I think as somebody else, I think. Could have been Chris in his presentation pointed out actually many many more windows have already been removed it's just you haven't looked closely enough to realize it so where a window has been replaced after the date of listing or is in an extension to the building created after it was listed then I think you know the idea would be to allow people to replace those with windows of you know the same design but double glazed uh, and that way you should be avoiding any possibility of um, sensitive fabric. Um, that would cover all grade two buildings in the borough. I think mostly focused on residential um, because, again, because of the GPDO, it makes, well, we'll see. It's out to public consultation at the moment. So I'm hoping to get some really good responses that can help us refine and, and improve it. Looking forward and actually just actually thinking about some lessons we've learned from the process so far, which I hope, hope you will um, find useful. Um, I think it's really important to help residents know what's going on. We've just managed to get the um, solar order on, on, onto a, its own page on the website, a retrofitting page. We need to do more to help people understand what they can do and what they can't do. We started in our SBD, but I think people need more help. It can be daunting. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people in listed buildings are assuming that the conservation, you know, conservation officer, let's be honest, is going to tell them they can't do stuff. So they're not even bothering to come forward. So I think it's really important to get the messages out there that that's not the whole picture. And I'm reading the room. I sense it's, you know, things may be different in other places, but, but that's not where we are. Um, I think, you know, the, these things are what you want them to be, um, you know, depending on resources I had to do this in a you know within three months I had to produce this I did enough research I think to get to make it cred creditable um if you have a more want to go into more depth in, a, in into a particular issue perhaps draw up sample drawings for people to follow you can do that it's all depending on time and resources um and but they can be light touch um in the way that we sort of tried to be they do need to be bespoke to the area you're looking at. So you could look at a whole borough or council area, part of it. You could focus on a particular building type. You could drill down into the details as, as again, in Port, Port Sunlight they've done. And I think that's a really good example of a really focused order. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I suppose looking forward also that, you know, we do need to be aware that, um, technology is changing fast and the whole situation is changing fast let's be honest and it's a chance for us to perhaps change the way we handle conservation to acknowledge that this is a very different world now from when the system was set up you know over 50 years ago the world is moved and we need to think about how we move with it um i think there's also issues there about bringing everybody along with you perhaps in your conservation team or your planning team i'll just leave that hanging there um, <laughs> um for, for, for now um i think is it the last last slide oh sorry yeah and um, just to say annual monitoring will be important because you have to produce you have to do that in the regulations i've had a lot of conversations with many other local authorities now who are really interested so i'm really hoping that we can inspire by taking that bold step and you know yeah and all the flack and, and everything that so that people can uh, perhaps take them up themselves Oh, we'll be looking at other orders. That's what our, our councillors are very keen for. So it could be after windows, maybe air source heat pumps or other forms of retrofitting. But I suppose the one point I forgot to make earlier is we do want to advocate a whole building approach. So we, I do know that these are the icing on the cake and we need to help people do all the things, you know, in terms of insulation um, and, 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 and small improvements, you know, dealing with damp and, and, and um, ventilation as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we're now going to move to a Q&A session. And I know that we have a big volume of, of questions. Um, so I'm just going to pull those up. Um, and we're going to start um, straight away. So the first question, all, all speakers, if you're ready, um, 
to what extent can we include this guidance in local plans? We have to balance staying high level, but also want to ensure we are being ambitious. That's, um, that's a great question. Um, would anybody like to take that? I can have a go while other people think. I think the first thing that springs to mind with local plans is that they've got a very long gestation, gestation period and then a very long lifespan. And so I think if we go into too much detail in local plans, we can actually stem, stimmy things. We've been involved in sort of evidence base for local plans where we felt we were being really bold, and really, um, uh, you know, groundbreaking. By the time it got through to examination, actually it was pretty much business as usual and um and so we, we wouldn't want that to then hold back future development so i think the the sort of angle that chris has taken with the supplementary planning documents which can be quicker and and can be used as evidence is quite a good approach yeah if i could just just I'd say something obviously because we are producing a local plan at the moment and that's absolutely right um Yes, and you can see how it's helpful to have that you know degree of detail there. But actually, it it can then it can then get caught up in given the lifespan of a plan. What we've done is provide the hooks. You know, we've said a we have you know at the apex as it were we've got a retrofitting policy, but we're also saying you know we will be following all sorts of things through, including these these in our conservation area management plans as we update them. We you know we are referencing our, our SPD which of course came before the local plan so it is having the right hooks in there to attach these and then these things can be produced perhaps on a shorter time scale but they've got the legitimacy of being referenced in the local plan and, and, and provided for in it that's that's what we're doing. Thanks Sarah I'm going to try and get through as many of these questions as possible there are quite a few and we are tight on time um, so this is a question for um, Caroline what is a realistic timeline for changes to the rules and guidance given that we're talking given that we're talking about a climate emergency here? I think that it's going to have to be an evolution and um, rather than kind of, you know, everything will change at this particular date. And certainly from the information that the briefing that I've had from the Islington planning team, it feels like what they're trying to do is to uh, put in place measures that enable them to help people to make the kind of conservation changes they want to make. Um, so they're trying to build up their resource for that. And they're trying to um, assess and or reassess and address all the planning rules um, kind of step by step as as they go. So I, I think it's it's the, the important thing is that local authorities understand the importance of making the changes and they understand the importance of trying to help residents and, and local businesses to make the changes that they want to change. And people are so incentivized to make these changes now because energy prices are just terrifying um and you know it's as, as we go through this week with sort of temperatures expected to go down to minus three suddenly it all becomes very very vivid and urgent in our minds um and so i think i wouldn't be focusing on an end point i'd be focusing on a journey and trying to get local authorities to be demonstrating that they're trying to be helpful and that they're trying to make the changes that are needed. Um, so I know that's not a very helpful reply. I'm not a kind of planning expert, so I don't know what the kind of planning timeframes are, but as a campaigner, that feels like the, the way that I, you know, what I'd be pushing for. I think that's right. And it's picking up on like the, the need that Will was touching on with the collaboration across industry and having those, um, having the input of all different local authorities through something like the London uh, Council's Retrofit Action Plan and others and and through work and networks such as these to disseminate that information but that was one on time there's a, there's a really interesting one here on cost Chris can you give us a sense of what an appraisal might cost <laughs> is there somebody saying can we have one of your climate <laughs> action plans please um and how can we plan ahead to do these appraisals in time to retrofit for 2030 um, it's hard to put any figure on it. I mean, this is something that I started during lockdown when we all had time on our hands 
and I just it's a labor of love I put into it and it, it's my neighborhood so I know it and, and I'm connected to it I think with these things we can't do such a detailed thing as I've done as has been mentioned and I think what one has to do is a more general survey and to do a borough-wide survey look at typologies of houses typologies of windows and come across something that we're, where maybe we also have to do things in a shared way. There are local citizens and residence groups that could also uh, help with this process. You could get people volunteering to look at streets and, and, and fill in forms. I think, I think we have to figure a different way to do it. Uh, we don't have the resource to do it you know, as we've done things in the past. And, and as Sarah said before, that conservation management plans will be updated, and, but they'll take time. To do them and maybe if a council does one uh, as a start or something a broader just to give what data you might need to do the spd that's a good way to think about it does anybody else want to come in on that then we've got a question around um you know the um well the question is as well as encourage full-blown retrofits does uh Caroline think that the council will also be open to exploring the notion of involving historic buildings one aspect at a time. So I suppose this is about taking, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, I'm sure everybody who's um, well versed in retrofit is sort of <laughs> just a little concerned about taking a, a single measure approach without a full assessment and a plan first. But I suppose given that we've talked about orders and advice on particular issues like solar, like glazing. I suppose the question is, could that evolution happen in that way? I think, I, 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 to be honest, I really don't know what the answer to that is. Um, and I would um, suggest, Chris, I mean, if you want to email um, the planning team, I'm sure we can get answers to questions like that. Um, but I, I just don't know what they're, what they're proposing um and and i don't even know if it's a good idea to do that or not so um so i would um yeah i whoever asked the question um if you want to email me at the council i can forward it on and get a reply um and that i'll put my email in the in the chat could i just add that um when you do sealed windows you need to do ventilation at the same time i think that's kind of critical and we used to have um a lot of new windows with trickle vents so then you had uh, you know air coming past as a almost as if it was a drafty window and a better way to do it is is probably a, a you know a better system but uh, maybe one has to say if you're going to do your windows you're going to do ventilation at the same time the other thing is that the retrofit coordinators are charging about 500 pounds a house to do a whole house plan that's a figure i've heard recently um and you get an awful lot for that amount of money but one thing that probably could be done is there could be shared retrofit uh, whole house plans done for typologies or streets and it would be good to, to share this on a council the council could councils could initiate how we could figure out typologies what could be the the order of how you retrofit and what is what is required something something along, along those lines thanks chris um there's a question for you chris um chris Jofa, that is how do we get buy-in from developers and building owners for the approach adopted in the toolkit to ensure compliance <laughs> <laughs> just a little question just a little, okay. little, little little easy one for you <laughs> yes how, how do we persuade 30 million homeowners to do what we want them to do um anyway you have oh, golly um i think one of the answers is we often focus on the homeowner as the center of all our attention there are there are many many organizations and individuals who influence the behavior of homeowners some of them may not realize that they do it and i think we need a, a structured and systematic approach um, such as that developed by the Centre for Behaviour Change at University College London, to work out, right, who, who, who are the different actors who influence homeowners? What do they have to do to create the conditions which homeowners choose to retrofit their homes and find it easy to do so well? 
So it, it's not just beat them over the head with information. Uh, it's not just dangle incentives. It's think about what will give them the capability, what will give them the opportunity, and what will give them the motivation to do what's needed. So there's no quick and simple answer, but there is a well thought through tried and tested process out there for working out what all these different actors do need to do so that people by and large will start to behave the way we need large chunks of the population to behave. Yeah. Um, would anybody else like to come in on that before I move to the next question? A uh, question for you, Will. How can we encourage historic England to support the approach adopted in the toolkit? Um, I'm probably not best place to answer that as I don't have too much direct communication with historic England. Um, but I think a lot of this is is working together for good solutions. And I, I think there's a there's been a lot of bad solutions for retrofit, which have sort of been quite a, a single channel approach. Um, and I think there's also been a lot of bad pushback, which has been a sort of single channel pushback. And the more we can sort of integrate, understand the commitments often both parties have made to made, you know, Historic England have as well. And they also need to understand the level of change which is needed to to get where we want to be. Um and 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 then we can sort of start talking about solutions. Um but I think, yeah, so I, I don't think it's always um us and them i think it's quite important that there's a there's a joint effort to find something which works well I, I think that's probably why the question might have been directed towards you because of the examples that you gave of um the collaboration that that, that happened with the letty um climate emergency retrofit guide for example because that if anybody looks at the list of people who was involved in that that's huge goodwill in the industry coming together to create what is an outstanding document much like what the documents are that we've seen in all the speakers presentations um today but i suppose the same question then from your more um experienced yeah. knowledge of working with that um, and yeah. sarah maybe might come in on that one as that's well about historic england as well yeah i think one that, that's, that's quite interesting uh, that that sort of angle on it i think one thing we've which is true of any organization is is the organization isn't everyone in the organization thinking the same thing and acting in the same way and exactly. much the same within you know, conservation officers or energy consultants historic england don't all act in the same way and and um so finding the people and the individuals who who sort of get it and want to action change and helping them with the evidence and um and uh you know thought case studies whatever it might be to convince others is quite a, a good angle yeah. well it is that part isn't it about i'm uh, just coming back to one of you mentioned reducing the burden um for planners and it's reducing the burden for any of these agencies by actually sharing the knowledge collectively that i think you get this this great work because i can imagine lots of people will take conservation area toolkit and use that in the same way that huge numbers of people have been using the letty retrofit guide and um, sarah did you want to maybe i don't know if do you want to add anything to that uh, well, I mean, it, you know, Historic England has is, is committed to, you know, to, to retrofitting and has produced a lot of really useful research information and guidance. So, you know, everything is, is there. But I think Will's made, just made the point that, yeah, so not everybody in an organisation is the organisation, as it were. And it, it may be it depends on who you who you're working with and and, you know, what or yeah c collaborating with and, and how they handle things you know so that's a, I think a very valid point on Will's part I mean I you know we continue to um work with them to you know to best of our ability but you know respectfully sometimes I you know we'll have to disagree with what with what they you know what they're telling me so it is that collective approach I mean I think we're all sitting here because we all believe in contributing to the knowledge bank and sharing that far and wide and we've heard from so many different perspectives and i know there must be so many people in the room and who will watch this um you know once we've got the recording out there who are also doing work trying to share that and i suppose not to go too political on it but you know we're seeing the the repercussions of years and years of austerity stripping away the ability for people to be able to share knowledge much more freely just interdepartmental conversations or even just inter-office conversations when the pressure is on for everybody to still be pushing um results so i think you know it's testament 
to, I mean, you know, well, you opened with an optimistic note and I think that's important for us to remember that, you know, it is trying times, really trying times, but we should take, um, you know, great uh, comfort in the fact that there's a lot of people pushing in the same same direction, trying to find those spots. Um, I think it's it's almost half past eight and I'm conscious of protecting people's time because it is a, a an evening. I've already had small humans <laughs> on my lap this evening. Um, but um, perhaps if we have um, any closing comments from each of our speakers, because you've contributed so um, generously this evening. So I'd love just a closing comment from, from each of you would be brilliant. And I'll start with Sarah because you're the first one on my screen. <laughs> Um, well, just what, what some, some great inspiring ideas I will be wanting to think about very hard in my own, <laughs> in my own work and in, in, as we do things in the borough in Kensington. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Caroline, you're next on my screen. Well, I'm just really inspired by everything I've heard and all these different people all over the place. Uh, doing everything they can to make those 2030 commitments a reality um, and in a in a in a practical way so um, you know I'll do everything I can to uh, keep holding Islington Council to account um, and and I just think the important thing is that collaboration as Sarah was just um, saying it's you know when we work together we can be so much more effective and it is so important that we don't in trying to retrofit homes create the problems that have been created in some people's homes with damp and condensation and mold so the importance of active ventilation and the understanding of the importance of that with retrofit uh, just feels to me like a really key message. Thanks Caroline and um, Will for next. Yeah, great. I think it's really inspiring to see that toolkit and those sort of um, examples of people taking action. And I think that's one thing I'd try and take away is that although it's an incredibly huge problem, although it's incredibly frustrating, things don't happen faster. We've all got to take those small steps. And there are a lot of people. There are a lot of problems, but there are a lot of people. And if we all take those actions and they will really add up and we'll start to see see momentum and movement and then that is all we can do so <laughs> that's the outcome with existing buildings it's mainly in climate change in the UK it's mainly about heat pumps heat pumps PV but heat pumps mainly so we haven't really talked much about that in this context but that's the big one to um to push and, and the rest has to come with it thanks Will um Chris Joffe we'll go to you and then we'll finish with Chris Proctor Okay, thank you. Um, I think my thought is about the urgency of acting. Um, we can't wait for local government and devolved administrations to study problems to death to get as close to 100% right as we can. We need them to act fast, get it about 80% right, and then, then get the feedback and correct as you go. We have to learn by doing rather than learn by studying, I think. Great point. Um, and Chris? Yes, um, I'd like to second that. If we start on this process, we will make a few mistakes, but we will also drive the industry to innovate. And I think there's a lot of innovation still to come with heat pumps. And there's some interesting things happening with ideas for smaller heat pumps, because when we have flats, we can't put in these massive big machines that are too expensive. We need to bring down the cost of heat pumps. Solar panels have gone through this huge technological change, and now you can get solar panels that are warrantied for 40 years um, that still after 40 years retain 86% efficient. So you could have a solar panel that may last 100 years because it, it gradually um, goes down over time, the efficiency. And why take something off even if it's only 20%? It's still generating electricity and mm -hmm. you still get that carbon. So what, you know, what if we have solar panels that last 100 years? That's amazing. Heat pumps also need to go through that change. Thanks, Chris. Um, just one last thing before we go, I'm going to very quickly share my screen again. Um, this is just if anybody is interested in getting a little more involved in ACAN, we have both our Embody Carbon uh, group and the Circular Economy group are also um, at the precipice of big, big um, campaigns that they've been running. So the Regulating Body Carbon Bill is being debated and voted on Friday please write to your MP. Um, if you scan that QR code, uh, that will take you direct to a template letter that the, the, the group has um, organized. 
Um, the circular economy group down here needs some graphic support for their circular economy design guide. You can check our circular series on our YouTube channel, um, which forms the basis for this circular economy design guide. So that's coming. So if you're a whiz in graphics and you want to get involved, then please, you'd be very, very welcome. That QR code for the circular economy um, will lead you to the circular economy graphics group. And finally, you can become a member of ACAN. Did you know that? You can become a member um, for as little as a pound. Um, that QR code, I've been mad for the QR codes this evening, but that one will take you to um, our Join It page where you can become a member um, and have your say in, in how we take um, the work of ACAN in, in the coming years. Um, but other than that, just a huge thank you to everybody, to our speakers. Uh, thank you to all for giving up your evening. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next day can events. But great thank you to everybody. Mm -hmm.